But before we move on, let's uh, open with a word of prayer once more. Lord Jesus, we know we need your spirit to work in our hearts. Um, you have said in your word that, that uh, you have imparted secret things to those who are spiritual. And so, Lord, we need you um, to help us understand what is in your word. And you are in the business of helping us do just that through your Holy Spirit. You want us to know. You want us to see. You want us to worship rightly. So we pray that uh, that happens here this morning as we spend this time with you. We pray this in your name. Amen. A few months ago, my daughter asked my son, my daughter's four, my son's six, asked him to play dolls with him, and remarkably, he agreed, and they were playing so well together that my wife wanted to go and encourage this by asking more about what was going on in this. So she says, hey, hey, Owen, what is the name of your baby? And Owen's quiet for a minute. He didn't know this was part of the thing that you name kids. And so he's considering it, and then he just, he's quiet for a moment. He says, Luke. And then as he's walking away, he says, under his breath, and I'm Darth Vader. And this would be really concerning if the only imitation he had was an imitation of a father from a dark side in a fictitious film. But my wife and I have confidence that all is not lost because he also imitates me. And what's been interesting to see is that as Owen becomes older and more mature, um, his means to imitate me also increases. For instance, I remember once when I, when, not when I was two, when he was two, uh, I was working in my office and I turned around to see that Owen had brought a box in and he set a book on the box and he was like pounding on it like he was working at his desk writing while I was sitting at my desk writing. But now Owen is able to write and so he's actually stolen one of the notebooks that I often carry around and he carries it around and he writes and makes notes in his notebook throughout the day as he's seen me do at various points. And the point of these two examples is that Owen is, has influences in his life that vie for his imitation. And my hope is that my influence might be so unique, not because I'm the only influence, but because he knows me in a special way. He gets to experience our home and this world as my son. And as my son, he knows my love, he knows my care, and he knows my warmth. In other words, my hope, even though he's imitating Darth Vader, is that when he gets older, when he has competing influences in his life and competing cries for imitation, that he will look at what he's experienced from me and he will see that as worthy of imitation because he's seen me not only as his dad, but as a trustworthy dad. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul is exhorting true believers to live in a manner fitting of the calling to which they've been called. He's saying that for the church, there is a world full of competing influences. And he wants the church, he wants believers just like you and me, if we believe in Jesus, to realize the trustworthy relationship we have with our heavenly father so that when faced with other influences, we might imitate God and not the world because we've experienced him as good. We know that there is life to be given when we're following our Heavenly Father. You see, where earthly fathers fail, God is never failing and only good. Paul's been setting this up as we've been working through the book of Ephesians, starting in Ephesians chapter 1, where he says that it was God's will before the foundations of the world to predestine us for adoption through Jesus, that God was going to make us his children. And his point is, is that if we've been made a child of the Father like this, then we've experienced his goodness. We've experienced his love. We can see him as trustworthy, and we should want to emulate him because we know it's good. We know it's good for us, and we know it's good for others. And so Paul is really tapping, and he's saying that that how you obey is tied to how you understand how you were saved. And we see this because this is where he opens in Ephesians 5, verse 1. He says, be imitators of God as beloved children. He's tying it to the way in which we have been made children in God's love. Paul is writing for your holiness. He is writing so that we as believers and corporately as the church, we might look less like the world and more like Jesus. And the point we're going to see today as we unpack this portion of Scripture is that if you are a believer who doesn't want to change, you might not be a child of God. 
Now let that sink in for a moment. If you are a believer who does not want to change, you might not be a child of God. In other words, what Paul is saying when he's tying this obedience to our Father in heaven, he's saying that it's not enough to know that Scripture demands you change. It's not enough to even know that God himself wants you to change. He's saying that if you have been loved by such an amazing father, you as a believer should want to change. The very basis of holiness in scripture is not that we are outsiders, not that we are detached, not even that we are children, but that we are beloved children, cherished children who know the goodness of their father. And because we've been loved by this father, We know that that relationship and being drawn nearer and nearer and getting closer and closer to that father by imitation is a life that just produces more and more love and more and more joy. We know that obeying this father can be costly, but this father is good with everything he demands from us because he saved us. And so what does it look like to imitate God? He's not here. There's nothing we can point to. What does it look like? That's a question we should be asking when Paul says, imitate God. Well, Paul gives for us three ways in which we might imitate God in this text. Each of them have to do with how we walk. That's Paul's primary metaphor for the Christian faith is a walk. It's not a sprint. It's not a couch. It's a daily walk. And there are three things we're going to see today. To imitate God, Paul wants us to walk in love, to walk in light, and to walk in wisdom. Walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. And that's what we're going to look at today. Just as a warning, the first point is going to be much longer than the other three, so don't like head for the exits when I say now to our second point. It's not, they're not going to be equivalent, okay? So be free from that burden. But why should we walk in love? This is our first point and Paul's first exhortation to us today. Why should we walk in love? It's not because love on its own is a virtue. That's not where Paul's going to go. Paul's going to say we should walk in love Because Jesus has loved us. If you're a Christian, you love because Jesus loved. That's what he says in Ephesians chapter chapter 5, verses 1 through the first part of 8. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality... And all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. That's another word for Christians. Therefore, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And so all throughout this portion of Ephesians, Paul is using contrast to help us understand his point. And here we see a contrast which highlights the beauty of Jesus and the love of Jesus and the filth of our sin. Specifically, he's contrasting how pure the love of Jesus is in comparison to the lowliness of the sins that so often fight for our love that so often seek to control our affections. And his point is, is he's showing how fundamentally different Jesus' love is than the things that the world often associates with love. And he holds up this trifold beauty of Jesus. And you see that if you have it there and you're looking at verse 2, there are three things that define Jesus' love. First, it was for us. Second, it was a fragrant or a sweet-smelling offering. And then lastly, it was a sacrifice to God. It was for somebody else, it was a sweet offering, and it was a sacrifice to God. Now, in contrast to that, he shows a threefold stink of sin. He talks about sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness. 
And it's actually in looking at how these things contrast that we're beginning to understand more and more why we should want a different love than what the world can offer. And so here we begin to see the contrast is first on the cross, Jesus gave himself up for you. If you're a believer, Jesus died for you. Now this in and of itself is amazing because he was the king. He's not your neighbor who liked you. He's not your brother who jumped in front of a bullet for you. He was the king. All the story of scripture up until the time of Jesus ached for God to send a king who would finally defeat the enemies of his people, make sense of the world, and bring peace. And then all of a sudden in the Gospels, Jesus is born, and all four Gospels carry this tone that the king has come. And not only is he a perfect man, but he's fully man and he's fully God. He is the the most unique human being to have ever lived, fully human, fully divine. He was worthy of everything, not only on a human scale, but on a cosmic scale. But on the cross, he came, and unlike kings that we know in our world, he didn't demand tribute from his people. Instead, he served his people. In fact, Jesus himself says in Mark 10, verse 45, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. You see, when the king came, the king to whom everything was due, he did not see people as a commodity to be consumed. Instead, he gave himself for them. He served them in the most costly way we as humans can imagine, by dying for our sin. And it's in this way that we see how opposite the love of Jesus is than the love that the world seeks to hold up in sexual immorality. Where Jesus' love was so other-oriented that he gave up his very life for someone else. The sexually immoral always take for themselves. The word Paul is using here for sexual immorality is the Greek word porneia which has the root word that you all hear for pornography. And this word doesn't just mean sex outside of marriage, and it doesn't just mean adultery inside of marriage, but it means any form of unlawful sexual intimacy. And this is important because uh, people have begun to narrow the scope of what this word means, and it's just not used that way in a biblical sense or in a secular sense during this time. The chance, we try to make gray area out of this word to say that what I'm doing is not sexually immoral. But if we're in the gray, we're falling into this category. And so what this word means is it includes anything outside of the bounds of one husband and one wife in marriage. That is good sexual intimacy. One husband, one wife in marriage. If it doesn't meet that, then according to the Bible, it is sexual immorality. This includes pornography in our world. It's still true whether or not the URL includes that language or if it just happens to be on Instagram or Twitter or Snapchat. It includes things we see. It includes things we hear. It includes things that we read. Things that cause us to become excited about pictures or thoughts of sex which are not one man and one woman in the confines of marriage for you to enjoy uniquely in that context. It speaks about uh, sex of any type that is not in this as well, which includes any sexual things of a homosexual sense, in a solo sense, in an oral sense, in any other sense where we might try to push the boundaries into the gray. This word stands and says, this is wrong. And why is it wrong? Why is it so wrong that Paul says, this should not even be named among you? Because there is nothing more opposite Jesus' love for us than sexual immorality. Sexual immorality always, in any sense, is a means to use people instead of serving people. We equate it with love. In fact, our culture flattens the whole of our identity, not just of love, but of personhood, to how we express ourselves sexually. But this is so small and so distorted from the goodness that God designed. 
Pornography is not love. It is empty and it flattens real people made in the image of God into pieces of selfish gratification that can be accessed on a click. It causes us online to flatten identities and in real life to objectify personalities. And what's actually at the heart of porn isn't love, isn't desire of any good sense. It's ultimately control and pride that lurks in your heart, demanding and desiring control. It is not love. And it will never, therefore, be able to give the feeling of love. It functionally subjugates and violently destroys people made in the image of God. Further, sex outside of marriage of any type, immediately begins to harm people. If you are a believer, we can look at commands like this, and we see God's high view of sex, one husband, one wife in marriage. And if we then see that and continue to move forward with sex outside of that bounds, it says two things. It says to God that I don't care about what you say. And it says to the other person, that I don't care if I cause you to sin in the midst of it. I want this pleasure, and I'm willing to use you to get it. You don't see that written on any Valentine's Day cards. Because it's not loving. It's tied to your pleasure. It's tied to your desires. And it subjugates and doesn't serve. A point of application here is that if you are with someone who in the name of love is calling you, urging you, pressuring you to do something of this nature because, quote, you love each other, God here is warning you that whatever it is you're about to experience, it is not love. It can't be love. Love serves It never takes. Walking in love means that we put aside sexual immorality because we realize true love gives for the good of others. How do we know that? Because Jesus loved us that way. It seeks to lay aside selfish desires, never to enthrone them. It will never be loving because it isn't love. Paul also says, second, that Jesus' love was a fragrant offering. The cross was beautiful. Now, when we think about the cross, on surface level, it's quite quite grotesque, isn't it? Maybe we've seen Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. We've seen the blood. We've seen the gore. It's not something that we like to sit at home and meditate on. But what Paul is saying here is that there is nothing unsightly about the cross. There's nothing filthy about it. When we as believers, with this lens, because that's what Paul is writing to, when you as a believer look at the cross, you do not see filth. Instead, you see love. You see perfect pleasure. You see stunning affection. You see beauty. It is a fragrant smell. Paul calls us, in contrast to this beautiful, fragrant offering of Jesus, to put away impurity. See, many of us can take false comfort Because of the external things, which we don't participate in. We're not sleeping with someone. We're not engaging in any sort of sexual intimacy with anyone outside of our spouse. We don't commit adultery. But inside, our minds and our hearts are filled with all sorts of impurity. You see, the human heart is the world's worst DVR. Your internet can go out. Your phone can break. Your computer can run out of batteries, but your heart doesn't. And it can fast forward and hate to see the demise of your enemies. It can rewind and pause and lust, replaying images, desires that we ought not to see. It causes us to look at things that our world says are attractive and beautiful, but when pressed, it stinks with the rottenness of our heart. Jesus' love, when pressed on a cross, was a blessing to everyone. Our hearts, if left in impurity, can easily poison a room. So what about for you, if you were to think of it? In your home, in your community group, in this gathering, if we were to uncork your heart, what would come out? 
would it be fragrant and cause others to see the beauty of what Jesus has done for you? Or would it cause us to become sick? Because the truth is, it's easy to see how it might cause others to respond. But even if it's never uncorked, it's already in you. That same poison is there eating at your soul. And this is where we need the hope of what Paul talked about last week, that it's only in the gospel that we can have our mind renewed, that the DVR can begin to be unprogrammed, and we can meditate on what is good and true and pure. We can take what it talks about in Philippians, and we can meditate on all the lovely things in the world because Jesus can really change our hearts. And lastly, the work on the cross to save sinners was a sacrifice which pleased God. Not only was it other-oriented, not only was it beautiful when pressed, but it was a sacrifice which pleased God. Jesus' love gave up. Jesus' greatest joy was living his life as a sacrifice for someone which was not him. His life, his joy, his love was a sacrifice to God. And this is where what Paul says, longings and covetousness, desiring, coveting, being greedy for, are so out of place in the Christian walk. It is hard to live sacrificially. It is hard to love sacrificially when our hearts are greedy for consumption. The two are opposed. If we are covetous, we are not going to sacrifice. Not in life and not in love. Because we want. We're seeking our own pleasure. We're buying for our own good. And this is true when we talk about sexual issues. The root of both sexual immorality and impurity is greedy gain. But this is true, unfortunately, in areas far broader than sex. This is true for how we shopped on Prime Day. This is true for how we look at our clothes or the house we live in or the job we want or the perception we desire. We want. And we don't want sacrifice. I was speaking to a sister in Christ this week, and we were talking about her conversion. And she had grown up in the church, but she said that there was a point where she never fully gave her life to Jesus. She never really took that step of faith because she feared that following God meant having things taken away from her. What a good gut check for us. That this could be the trip line of our heart. Is there a point where when sacrifice comes to play, we step back? Because we covet and we want and we're unwilling to move forward towards God. You see, the truth is, is when our love refuses to sacrifice for the sake of God, we have quickly and already begun to sacrifice to another God. That's why Paul calls it idolatry. Because you do love things, you will sacrifice to those things. And if what you love is not shaped by the love of God, it is always idolatry. But now in speaking to this lady as an example, she says that inside of her salvation, she realizes that following Jesus cost way more than she ever thought. She had too little view on what it was going to cost or take away from her. But now in seeing what Jesus has done, it was worth it. There was nothing she lost that hasn't been made up for in what Jesus has provided, not materially, but spiritually. The world's love is self-centered, toxic, and greedy, but Jesus' love is other-oriented, pure and fragrant, and a sacrifice of great value. You see, our world does not know love. It can't. You've seen the holiday in commercials where someone's about to go in for like open heart surgery and the doctor says something weird and they're like, wait, are you a doctor? And they said, no, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. That's what the world does with love. They can't know it unless they know Christ. No one can give you love in its truest form unless they've seen it applied in its truest form, which is salvation in the gospel. And this is the way that all of you, if you have been saved by Jesus, were saved. You are saved by this kind of love. Jesus doesn't save some in some sort of lottery of pity and others that have true potential he loves. He loves you and he saves you. You are not saved because you did what was right. You are not saved even because you understood the theology of the atonement. You are saved because Jesus loved you with this kind of love. 
which means this other-oriented, beautifully fragrant, God-pleasing sacrifice is your experience. You now have a measuring stick that you could pull out in your pocket when the world begins to whisper what love might be, and you may measure it according to Christ and say, this does not match up. This is not for my good. This is not beautiful. This is not satisfying. The point of these contrasts is to show how far the world's love is from the love of Christ. How far is it? Look at the warning Paul provides if you miss it in verses 5 through 6. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Do you hear what Paul is saying in this text? A life dominated by these desires is so far removed from the love that Jesus provides that if you continue to follow and to feed these desires, it could very well be that you have never experienced the love of Jesus. Because if you experienced that love, Ephesians 5, 2 love, you should see all of this as counterfeit. You should see all of it for the emptiness that it professes. And here Paul gives a warning to you, to the church, to self-professing believers that you might not be deceived. Paul is saying that you as a professing believer might be deceived into thinking you're a Christian while not being one. The lie is, the deceit is, the empty words is that you might be loved by Jesus and still engage in these practices and expect to be saved. That we understand what the Bible says, but we don't have to do that. That there would be grace for me But what Paul is saying here is to not want to put these to death, to not see the life-killing power of it, is to be in danger of judgment. That God will not meet you with mercy, but that he will actually take away from you the eternal inheritance that you are looking for. That instead of being met with riches, the wrath of God will be poured out on you. Do not be deceived. Do we stand in fear at texts like this? I tell you, there were times this week in studying this text where I'd pick up my phone or I'd open Netflix and the fear of this text shaped what I did. Because it was never how close can I get. Because if we understand the weight of what Paul is talking about here, it should give us fear. It should justify the destruction of our laptops, the disregard of our phones, the changing of lifestyles, the ripping of relationships, and even a change in your very vocation. Because eternity is at stake. Your soul is exposed to the danger of a lie. So how then do we see the truth? The competing influences are loud. The imitators are plentiful. This is where we need to see the greater joy, which is in the gospel. Look back at verse 4 where Paul is continuing to define the fruits of false love and look at where it ends. Let there be nor filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. 
the innate contrast between a life of sin and a life lived in love is thanksgiving. The number one way for, to fight sin is to be thankful that in Jesus' love, in the love defined in chapter 5, verse 2, we have everything we've ever hoped to experience in love. If you study the men behind most of the philosophical revolutions in our world, you will find almost to a rule that at some point their private lives devolved into some sort of unlawful, deviant, or incestual sexual immorality. Almost to a rule. And that's because no godless philosophy, no matter how accurate it can describe our brokenness, can ever tame the cravings of our heart. You see, we always participate in these three things, in lust, in impurity, and in greed, because we hope that it might give us that inheritance. We hope that we might, at the end of it, when we buy it, when we see it, when we engage in it, that we might be thankful. But we never feel that way, do we? It never leaves us full. It always leaves us empty. And Paul plays off that desire for certainty. And he says, you hope that this will certainly give you what you want. But I'm telling you, it certainly cannot. That's why he says, you may be sure of this, that the wrath of God stands behind these things. But there's a greater promise right here in the book of Ephesians. The same certainty that we look to sin for, Paul says, you can have in Jesus for certain an inheritance. You can have in Jesus for certain everything you've ever hoped for. And we saw this back in chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. In Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we inquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Jesus gives it to us. Everything we hope for in sin, Jesus has promised us in him. You see, if you're a Christian and if you struggle in any of those areas, you need to stop and you need help in stopping that. But even more helpful in that is that ultimately you need to see that Jesus has already met those needs, that Jesus has filled you, that Jesus loves you, that Jesus has given himself for you, that Jesus' whole strength is for you, that the Holy Spirit has filled you, that you have access to the very pleasures of God, that there is nothing left on the table that Christ has not provided for you. Last week I shared an illustration of the cholera outbreaks in 19th century London. And to stop the disease, the authorities of the time said that you have to drink more water, not knowing that it was specific pumps in the city of London that actually contained the disease. And so their very prescription sought to provide more and more poison. The cure was the disease, and so is sin. It always promises, but only sickens. However, there's one scientist who realized that the problem was the water. The problem was, is that no one could see it. You hold up a glass of water, you even look at it under a magnifying glass, it looks just like any other water. And so he had trouble convincing people of this. And so what happened was, he removed the handles of the pump. He went, he removed it, and he chained up the pump because he knew the danger of it. And he knew that if he ever wanted health to come, the handle had to be removed. This is what Paul is saying here. That Paul wants you to see the invisible biology behind all of your sin and how lethal it is. Even if the world says you're crazy. So I have a question for you. What handles need to be removed in your life? What pumps do you go to time and time again to contribute to this impure poison and these false desires? Because Paul's metaphor here at the end is that light has now come to bear on your heart. 
that you might now see not only the poisoned water, but that you might see the pure water. The water that comes from Jesus. Water that causes you to thirst no more. Water that cleanses. Water that saves. Water that satisfies. And this is where Paul says, because you are now children of the light, seeing the danger and tasting the goodness, he gives his second point. Walk in the light. Let's continue in Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of these things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that is visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and the light of Christ will shine on you. So what does it look like to walk as children of the light? Paul gives two things. Try to discern what is good and right and true and expose that which is darkness. And we're going to come back to that discerning bit in a while, but right now I want us to see Paul's logic here. And that's if Jesus has loved you, if he has made you a child of the light, then not only do you examine and try to discern what is good and right and true, but you also learn to expose what is false. And this means not only do we cut away partnerships, of the kingdom of darkness. It might mean not doing things with certain friends in certain places. Not only do we have nothing to do with those sinful actions, but Paul says instead you expose them. That's ominous, isn't it? To expose them. Look at what he says again in verses 11 through 14. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Now, if there's one thing that we are wired to avoid, it's this kind of exposure, isn't it? Lights coming on, sheets being thrown off, doors being kicked open. The whole of our lives are designed to prevent that from happening. And Jesus explains why, the theological reason in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Jesus says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come out to the light, lest his works should be exposed. This is so important for believers to understand here. Because my guess is that most of us, if we were to take this list that Paul gives us earlier in this text, we can find those dark corners of our heart where covetousness or impurity or sexual immorality lies in darkness, fermenting, poisoning, and destroying. And our initial response, maybe even you had it in here today, is to batten down the hatches to make sure no one sees it to not let anyone in. But inside this passage, which on the surface is frightening, we see the beautiful works of the gospel at play. As terrifying as it might sound to be exposed to such a light like this, Paul wants us to see that we should want this kind of light. This very passage shows us how no religion has a God as good as our God. What kind of God so clearly communicates the damnable actions of sin, the danger of that sin, how disgusting that sin is. Don't even talk about it. But then the very next thing he says is to bring that sin into his light. How many of you, when hearing a judge, read how damnable a sin is, a crime is, to hear the sentence that is supposed to be carried out on that criminal, and you're in the audience, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, I did that too. By worldly standards, that's suicide. But by gospel standards, this is the beauty of repentance and grace. When we bring our sins to light, no matter how filthy, no matter how secret, we bring our sins to the only person who can expose the filth 
and enliven our hearts. Do you see what Paul said in verse 14? For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Why would we be willing to take the scariest, most shameful secret places of our hearts and bring it into a light like this? Why would we as members do the hard work of helping others do the same? Because we want that light. We really do. We know what comes with it is exposure (laughs) that burns. Exposure that confronts. Exposure that convicts. But what also comes with it is the very light of Christ which warms our souls. You see, Jesus is the only one that we can ever bring our sins to, the only light we can ever run into and know that it can be dealt with. To know that Jesus can see the filth, the stain, the disease, and he can take it. And he can die for it. And the same light which cuts is the same light which warms us to life. All of these commands in verse 14 are given to dead men. What God commands the dead but our God? What God wakes us with such strength and such grace as our God What God promises such goodness in the face of such evil, but our God. Gospel light wakes the dead. And if you have been saved, it has already woken you. What more do you have to lose? Has he shown his lack of trust? Has he shown irrational anger? Has he shown an inability to match up to the challenge? Or has he shown you grace after grace after grace after grace? You see, you can't want gospel change without wanting the light of Christ. Because it is for your good. Do not leave here today and think you want anything unless you want this Jesus. Unless you see the good news of the gospel, that he takes what was wrong and he bears it so that we might stand robed in his perfection, that Jesus and Jesus alone is our hope. So where do you need to dig? And what do you need to drag into the light of Christ? For it'll be hard, it'll be sticky, but Jesus is big enough and his grace sufficient. To imitate our Father, we should not only want to love Christ, but we should want the light of Christ. And this lastly shapes how we walk in wisdom. Our final point, walk in wisdom. As Paul is calling us to imitate God, what you're seeing is he's actually pointing back in all three of these things, he's pointing back to how you were saved. Do you know what Jesus did to save you? Then have faith that this life of putting off sin is really reasonable. That you really can do it. He says, Jesus has loved you. Jesus has shown on you. And now he says, the Holy Spirit has filled you. Verses 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, and giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So far we've seen if we've been loved, we ought not lust. If Christ has shined his light on us, we ought not live in secrecy. And if the Holy Spirit has filled us, we ought not live in foolishness. And drunkenness. Now, if we're called to imitate God as beloved children, if He is our Father and we see only goodness in Him, then not only should we do what He wants, but shouldn't we start to want what He wants? Shouldn't our desires slowly meet the desires of the Father? This is Paul's point twice now, once in verse 10 and once in verse 17. 
Paul implores us to discern what the will of God is and to discern what the pleasure of God is. This also can be really ominous if we don't understand it right. We have, Paul's not saying, hey, know what your wife wants for her birthday or know what your parents plan for your education is because we already like crack under that weight when those time comes. He's actually saying, know what pleases the creator of the universe. Know what the plan of God is for your life, the one who breathed the world into existence. This would be a terrifying quest if God hadn't already told us the answer to these questions, wouldn't it? But he's already told us. We know what pleases God. We know what God's will is. In Ephesians 1 verse 10, Paul opens it and he says, It is God's will for the fullness of of time to unite all things, things in heaven and things on earth, in Jesus Christ. That's God's will. That we would be one to Christ with the rest of the believers in this world. What pleases God, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, what pleases God is that we would, as the church, seek to live out our salvation and minister to one another so that we might be more like Jesus, that we might build up the body of Christ so that the world might see more of Christ. God's will and God's pleasure is that we would work for his glory and grow in holiness. That's the answer to the questions. That's what we should see is the answer to God's will and God's pleasure is his glory and our growth in holiness as the church. My wife and I, we love the Food Network. And uh, one of the things we often do when we go to a new town is we look and see if any of the restaurants in that town have been on the show Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Um, and the host of that show is a famous celebrity chef. You might have heard of him, Guy Fieri, Guy Fietti, however you want to say it, no one knows. And so, but his life is spent just touring around and eating at various restaurants. And so we see it this way. If that pastrami sandwich was good enough for Guy Fieri, it's certainly going to satisfy me. If it pleased him, the expert in this area, it will satisfy me. That's how endorsements work. All throughout our culture, endorsements are central to our economy. If a celebrity wants it, it's going to work for you commoner. If an NFL athlete, my son is, loves Greek, oik, oik, I don't even know what it is, some sort of yogurt that Cam Newton eats. And he's like, football players eat this yogurt, therefore it's good enough for me. But did this endorsement from God do it for you? Do you view God and his pleasure through the same lens? If we're honest, it's really easy to yawn at the idea of living for God's glory and striving for holiness in our life. But this is what satisfies the creator and sustainer of the whole universe. There is no greater endorsement to be given than the pleasure of God. He has revealed to us in his word the source of his joy And if we have seen the joy that satisfies the divine being, wouldn't we want to live our lives to that same end? Wouldn't we want to lean into that satisfaction? Wouldn't we want to experience that intimacy? This is why drunkenness and foolishness, Paul says, have no place in the Christian walk. They make us thoughtless towards the things of God. They make us useless in the plan of God. They not only have a negative effect on those around us, but it actually shortchanges your joy. You miss out. Others are hurt. And glory is left on the table. But when we are filled with the Spirit of God, when we know what God is doing in this day and age through His Spirit in His church, we can live a life laden with the very satisfaction of God Himself as we live for His glory. Do you consider that? That's what Paul is saying. Do you consider what it's like to live for God's glory? Because what lies behind God's glory is seen in Psalm 1611, experientially for us. What is in it for us? David says this, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now we come full circle. Don't you want that? If that's what's offered, wouldn't we reasonably say whatever it takes, I want that. Whatever it takes, I need that. And this is why we walk in the Spirit. 
We seek to make the most of our lives by considering how our lives, our homes, might magnify the glory of God. But Paul makes it clear here. Be careful. It's clear in Scripture. This is what God is for. This is where joy is at. Why is he saying be careful? Because we're so easily deceived. We are so quick to take other endorsements or competing influences. And so Paul helps us. What does it look like to walk in the Spirit? What are the training wheels of the desires of God? He sends us to church. He sends us to each other. Did you see that? You see that other-oriented nature in verses 19 through 21? Addressing one another in spiritual psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Don't we get to do that in a minute? Won't that be great? Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Here we see a wonderful picture of what the church does. Church does all sorts of things, but here we see the church together prepares each other for heaven by reminding us of the inheritance we know for certain, by pointing us to the goodness of God who saved us, You see, in aimlessness and drunkenness, our conversations can be wrought with vanity and vulgarity, but in the church, we speak, we sing the wonderful weight of salvation to one another, which produces, again, did you see it? Did you see what showed up? Thankfulness. Don't you want that? Isn't that what all of our life is looking for? All of our desires, all of our consumption, all of our covetousness, it wants the feeling of thankfulness. And here it is according to God's desire. It is God who is giving it to you as you walk in the spirit, in the light of Christ, in the love of the gospel. Do not be deceived, church. The commands of God will never fail to fill you with the thankfulness of God. Do not be deceived, church, that all that the world offers will fail. But God, our Father, has offered you security and joy in a life spent imitating him even when the costs are high. So this week, let us seek to put away the deceitful desires and put on love. Let us come out of darkness and be robed in the wonderful riches of Christ's light. And let us put aside vanity and foolishness and with wisdom live spirit-filled lives of thankfulness for his glory. And let's start now. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that we get to practice. And starting now, we are going to immediately go into a public confession of sin, to confess the sin and the darkness that's in our hearts to acknowledge what you've done to save us. And then afterwards, we get to sing to one another. We get to remind each other of the beauty of Jesus and to proclaim the glory of the God who saved us, the only God who promises for certain the very thing we look to for sin, but he promises it with life and an inheritance forevermore. Turn our eyes from worthless things and fix them upon your glory. Help us to be vigilant in wanting what you have given to us and in killing what stands against us. We love you, Lord. May this church be typified by this text. We pray this in your name. Amen.